Buonasera a tutte e a tutti e bentornate, e bentornati eh, all'incontro di oggi. Oggi avremo tra le relatrici Cristina Rosiglio Lopez, eh, la conosciamo già, la conoscete già tutti perché è una partecipante molto attiva al nostro seminario, eh, da cui il suo contributo al dibattito è sempre molto notevole, per quella cosa siamo grati, siamo molto grati infatti di essere qui tra noi e di aver accettato di presentare un paper. C'è un ritorno di presentare un paper um, che si pronuncia molto interessante. Due parole veloci sulla relatrice. Eh, Cristina Rosiglio insegna storia antica all'Università de Pablo Lavide de Sevilla in Spagna. Eh, ha una produzione scientifica molto ricca eh, che grosso modo un po' grossolanamente da parte mia, può essere divisa in tre temi strettamente connessi fra loro. Gli studi sulla storia politico-culturale della Roma tardo-repubblicana, che includono anche gli studi sulla retorica e sul dibattito politico, sulla, proprio sulla metodologia eh, de, de la, del discorso politico, una serie di studi sulla memoria del passato, sulla costruzione della memoria del passato come fenomeno identitario in età romana, e un'altra serie di studi molto interessanti sulle finanze della Repubblica collegate al concetto di corruzione. Ha pubblicato tantissimi lavori su questi aspetti, vorrei solo segnalare velocemente la monografia del 2017 sull'opinione pubblica, Public Opinion and Politics in the Late Roman Republic, pubblicata per CUP, e quella molto interessante, altrettanto interessante, sulla corruzione, pubblicata in, nella collana di Storia 2010 nonché la curatela di un bellissimo volume sulla comunicazione politica a Roma, eh, edito da Brill, sempre nel 2017. Stasera, se ho capito bene, correggimi se sbaglio, ci parlerà di un argomento di estrema rilevanza eh, proprio per questi aspetti, cioè l'interazione eh, politico-istituzionale tra Senato e magistrati sia nel secondo che nel primo secolo a.C., quindi nella fase diciamo, eh, culminante dell'ascesa della, 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 della Repubblica Imperiale. Ma appunto lascio subito a lei la parola eh, e la ringrazio ovviamente di aver accettato di partecipare. Grazie Mattia per la presentazione. Um, uh, uh, I would like to thank first of all Federico and, and Mattia really for organizing uh, this um, international Roman Republican corner of Zoom. Um, which is um, one of the great findings, actually, of this uh, whole um, coronavirus, coronavirus uh, experience. So it's really a privilege and a challenge to talk um, here. Um, I would like um, to point out that I will um, speak in English only for one reason, and the reason is that I had already done this research and written this research that I'm going to present here in, in English. Um, I love to address the uh, present um, audience here in, in Spanish. Uh, there have been recently um, very long discussions through um, email about our use of modern languages uh, as a discipline and Spanish is clearly one of the um, strongest candidates who maybe join the top rank of modern scientific languages in ancient history, but that it will be for another um, occasion. And so I'm going to share uh, the screen and I'll start straight away. Uh, you can see it, right? There. Thank you. So uh, what I'm going to present here today uh, aims at studying two aspects of Roman governance. First of all, the overlooked but relevant power of decision of the consuls and in a minor degree of the practice. And secondly, the relationship between magistrates and the Senate. So this is part of a wider future um, a study of the relationship actually between magistrates and the Senate in the second and first centuries BCE. So uh, really a small part um, ongoing and, and process. So my question today here is, Oh. So, who took political decisions during the late Republic? And your answer, actually, just think about that for a second. If you have to answer in a one or two words, your answer really is very indicative of how you view Roman politics. So is it the Senate? 
the magistrates, the assemblies. Um, it, it, it's really, uh, I think it's a challenging question. Uh, I'm not going to give a full answer, obviously, because that would be very, very complicated. But I'm going to, um, what I'm going to uh, present here is around this um, topic. So let's focus on the Senate, for instance. Uh, how to pass a Senatus Consultum? We all know the procedure. So we have a magistrate with use referendi, so a council or a praetor, convince the Senate. A relatio is brought forward, then the senators are asked for their opinion, and finally the question is vote, and it becomes a senatus consultum. Um, later on, there is a commission who writes down the actual senatus consultum and is deposited in the aeradium. Uh, if the senatus consultum is vetoed, it becomes what it's called, uh, at least in Ciceronian times, it's called a senatus auctoritas. And it carries some weight, uh, actually, but it's not a full um, legal uh, senatus consultum. But the cases that I'm going to present today show a different pattern of decision making. So we have exactly the same procedure, but the, what the vote of the Senate and the, what the senatus consultum says is we delegate the decision in a consul. Uh, or a praetor. So shall the council or the praetor decide himself? Um, this is something that is not exceptional for the Senate. The Senate regularly delegated decision, decisions, sorry, especially in pro magistrates or legati who are in situ. And obviously this makes sense. They have to take decisions, they are away on campaign or in their provinces, they have to take decisions. They are the ones who are really better placed to know what's the best decision um, to put um, into and to practice. And I have to list um, there are several um, uh, cases uh, such as uh, during the Second Punic War, one consul and one consul who wrote to the Senate and the Senate decided, okay, you decide to take the decision. And then we have two uh, epigraphical, um, epigraphical texts, the Senatus Consultum de Tisvensibus and the Stratonicensibus in which there is, in the Tisvensibus is just a part of it. And in the Stratonicensibus as well, well, the Senate decide, okay, and let, rise, uh, let the consul write to the proconsul and um, or proprietor and let them, that person in place decide. But what I have found or what really struck me when I was um, doing this is that we have instances in which there is a decision which is delegated to councils and praetors who are in Rome, they are in Rome and the city. Um, so how do we understand this? The relationship between the Senate and the magistrates is not a new matter of debate, of course. Our previous lines of research have focused um, especially on the dominance of the Senate and how it imposed or how it could impose its will on, on the magistrates. Um, secondly, on um, cases in which the magistrates defied that institution and acted of their own accord, especially commanders and, and governors, because uh, ancient historians and modern historians, we love conflict. And as we that it's something that is more appealing than boring legislative procedures. And finally, um, more recently, um, a third line of the relationship between um, Senate and the magistrates is very ten something it's more tangential. It's how the senators reach decision and vote. This is very linked to um, um, certain uh, German colleagues such as Flag or, or Timon who work on especially on around this consensus idea but not only uh, but those are really um, the latest um, um, historians who have um, focused on, on the decision making pattern within the Senate. Uh, but what I'm referring here the delegation of decision to consuls and praetors in Rome so the decision making pro power sorry of those two magistrates was extremely tangentially really one just one or two lines in Mumsen and Villain so very ampersand and it's completely absent 
from the new or more recent works on the Senate and the consulship, I'm sorry, I forgot, and on the praetorship uh, as, as well, or Kunkel and Widman, they don't uh, talk um, uh, about it. Um, so I'm talking about instances in which the senators decide not to take um, the decision themselves, and they delegate it fully or partially, we'll see, um, that to a consular predator who is in Rome. It is not a suggestion expressing the customarily um, uh, words of the invitation to the consuls to do something. It is not the execution of that decision, such as it was, for instance, the very detailed instruction of the Senatus Consultum de, de Bacchanalibus. Um, the instances that I'm uh, are we, are we showing, the Senate decided that the consuls or the praetors, so mostly the consuls, should make, should take those decisions of their own back. So really, you decide. Why is this, has, why has this been overlooked? Well, one of the reasons I think is that in his account of the Roman, how the Roman state and the Roman government work, Polybius did not make any a specific mention to the decision powers of the consuls in Rome. He talked very extensively about and their military power. And uh, when he talked about Rome, he specifically mentioned that they take, uh, that all magistrates take orders from them, that they introduce foreign ambassadors, bring matters, matters before um, the Senate, they execute the decrees of the Senate, summon the popular meetings, bring the proposals before the people, carry out decrees, etc., etc. But he did not mention that the councils have a power of decision. And I think this is something that has contributed to obscure this issue. A second reason is that this pattern uh, of delegation of decision into um, councils uh, that we find, as we'll see uh, throughout the second and the first centuries, uh, BC, may appears mainly in epigraphic sources. That is, in the Senatus Consulta preserved in Greek translation, and very marginally in literary sources. And I'm going to explain uh, why. So, the, I'm sorry, the corpus that we got are 24 Senatus Consulta translated into Greek before 49 um, BC. Um, how literary and epigraphic sources approach legislative procedure is very different, obviously. Uh, historians who mention Senatus Consulta, like Livy, Dionysus of Halicarnassus, and Appian, probably did not consult the originals. Um, uh, Vierk, um, uh, thought that maybe Polybius had seen some copies. Uh, one of the exceptions is Flavius Josephus, he, since he copied the Senatus Consulta that referred to the Jews, although um, their accuracy and even their authenticity has been challenged by some historians. The only exception would be Caius Rufus, who in a letter sent Cicero copies of a Senatus Consulta and of three vetoed Senatus Consulta. But when we look at how these historians mainly, uh, leaving Caius Rufus aside, um, 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 bring back to us those um, Senatus Consulta, we see and in general um, um, senatorial uh, procedure, uh, they, we see that clearly in Libya. They compress, they cram, they reduce procedures so as to make the historical narrative more fluid. Obviously, because readability is one of the things that they have in mind. Uh, and let's face it, laws and legislative procedure can be extremely boring. So for instance, in 168, one of the sons of King Massinissa arrived uh, uh, at Rome and spoke before the Senate. And as it's one of the um, duties of the, the quaestor, the quaestor was ordered to buy gifts for the prince, to escort him to Putioli, to provide for all his expenses, et cetera, et cetera. But Livy, Livy's account is correct, actually, but it's also somehow ambiguous as a very specific point of senatorial procedure. That is, who ordered the quaestor in Livy's text is not clear. We know that the Senate never gave direct orders um, or never addressed himself to a mag or itself to a magistrate of inferior rank. Uh, the Senate only addresses itself to consuls and prayers. The Senatus Consultum 
uh, that Livy, uh, more, Livy is mentioning, uh, could have been worded as an invitation from the Senate to the consul to order the quaestor to provide for the prince, exactly as we find in the Senatus Consultum de Asclepiade of 78 BCE, um, which rewarded three Greek navarchs with Roman citizenship. And uh, the translation would be, the consuls are to instruct uh, the quaestor urbanus to provide them with gifts according to the official formula, et cetera, et cetera. So we see it's really, I mean, Livy's text is mainly correct, but if we are looking for this very specific point of, um, of uh, legislative and senatorial procedure, the richness of the epigraphic senatus consulta cannot be much, and especially because um, as we can see, usually those um, literary sources compress uh, that uh, procedure. So, of those 24 Senatus Consulta that we've got, four of them are too fragmentary. So they are not really, we cannot really read much. And two of them are not decisions because they just confirm uh, Sola's um, concessions in the East. So we have a corpus of 18 Senatus Consulta in which, um, uh, which uh, we can um, uh, work with. Of these 18, uh, we find that the Senate decided in 10 instances, in 10 cases. And the Senate delegated the decision in eight instances. So it's almost not, it's not 40%, but it's near 40%. 40%. And um, I'll, I'll talk about this um, more in depth um, shortly. Of those eight cases, four of them are full delegation. So the whole matter is um, uh, left into the hands of the consuls or the praetor, and four of them are partial delegations. So uh, of a question, the Senate decides on a part, and one or two or three points are left for the magistrates to um, decide. So this number suggests that the delegation of decision-making powers uh, was not a rare of, or isolated occurrence, but eight out of eight and sorry, eight out of 18, it's a, it means a regular procedure incorporated into the routine of the government. So what type of cases do we find? Um, disputes between cities, problems regarding taxation and foreign uh, affairs. So obviously the, the first um, question that you may uh, tell me and, and, and you will be right. Okay, so this is something, you know, re typical regard thing regarding the Greek communities and, you know, the Senate is bored with all these long ambassadors talking on the Senate and, and that's it. Um, I think that is not something that should be restricted to the relationship between the Senate and the Greek communities. The problem is the sources that we've got, that all those senators consult that come from Greek communities who were so happy that the Senate had decided on their favor that they engraved that law and put it on display. And we have just got this. We don't have um, that for Western um, communities or for other uh, type of decision that we know maybe we're um, uh, of uh, more Italian or just purely Roman political scope. We don't have that. So that's why we have that, um, uh, those um, type of cases. And actually, uh, in all these cases, there is always a formula that tells you that you are in face of a delegation of decision, as I will show you in a minute. And the formula is the following. Ita ute e republica fide sua Videbitur esse oder videretur, that we have um, uh, preserved in the obviously Greek translation, uh, ekton, demosion, pragmaton, pisteos, tutes, ideas, fine uh, tie. So the Senate entrusted the magistrate with reaching a decision according to the public interest, a republica, and their own good faith, um, the fitness. So finally, uh, let's see the sources. Um, these are the four instances and uh, the four cases of full delegation of decision. Uh, we have the Senatus Consultum, the very important Senatus Consultum, the Agro Pergamena, which may be dated 129 or 101, uh, depends on which date you uh, prefer. Um, 
uh, dispute between two communities in, in Crete, which was um, solved in 112 um, BCE. The dispute between the city of Oropus and the Publicani in 73, and uh, another dispute between the city of Mytilene and the Publicani in 55. And then we have four more uh, partial delegations of decisions, which are those three in the second century, so part of the Senatus Consultus de Tisbensibus, uh, the Senatus Consultus de Prenensibus, and uh, the Senatus Consultum de Magnetum et Prenensium Litibus. And finally, um, sorry, also in the second century, the Senatus Consultum de Collegis Artificum Bacurum, in which just a part of the decision, a part of the matter is left to, is delegated on that decision uh, into the consul or the tribe. Uh, let's focus on the first one, which I would like to um, uh, present here. The Pistola Luci Calpuni Pisones et Senatus Consultum de Itanodum et Iera Pitniorum Litibus of 112. Um, it, the, this text chronicles the very long conflict, which lasted almost 30 years, between the two cities who are on the screens here. Um, um, uh, yeah, Pitnia, and here is Itanus, who disputed the land near the sanctuary of uh, Zeus Dictaios and the small island of Loike, um, which is also on the screen. After reviewing the previous details of, of the case, the Senatus Consultum is clear that the consul decide best in the interest of the Republic and according to his own faith. Uh, the consul, Lucius Calpurnius Piso and Caesoninus, uh, appointed an arbiter. And it should be highlighted that the Senate did not suggest the consul to appoint an arbitrator, as it had happened in other cases. We have other cases in which uh, the Senate says, um, and I um, um, uh, let it, if, uh, if the consul uh, sees fair, he should appoint an arbiter, etc. No, is that he should decide on the matters he considered best. Calpurnius Piso opted for appointing an arbiter, but he could have also chosen to decide on the matter himself. In fact, this is the only instance of delegation of decision in a council in which the magistrate appointed an arbiter. In the other three cases, it was the council who, who took the decision um, himself. We should put this in comparison with a similar case date around the middle of the second century, in which the Senate decided to exert more control in the matter and only delegated partially the decision. The cities of Priam and Magnesia appealed to Rome because of a dispute over lands near the river Meander. After hearing them, the Senate decided that the praetor Marcus Aemilius, who was the convening uh, magistrate, should appoint an arbiter who was acceptable for both parties. But, um, as the Senatus Constitution said, if one mutually acceptable to them is not found, then the praetor shall give them an arbitrator as seems to him to be in keeping with the interests of the Republic and his own good faith. In comparison with the case of Itanus and Mirapidnia, Marcus Emilius was given less leeway he can only appoint, he has to appoint an arbiter and only in case that the two cities don't, don't really reach a, a decision on, on who could be or what city could be an acceptable um, arbiter. Disputes over taxation and conflicts with the public army are a second category in which at least in two cases, the Senate left the full decision on the matter in the hands of a magistrate. The Senatus Consultum de Agro Pergameno uh, dealt with a delicate situation in Asia after it has been um, uh, left, uh, as we know, in, uh, in, the, in the, the will of, of the king uh, Attalus to um, Rome and after the revolt of Aristonicus afterwards. So when a controversy arose between Pergamum and the Publicani regarding taxation, a Pergamese embassy was dispatched to Rome to um, submit the matter to the Senate. Faced with this complicated and contentious issue, because really they are deciding on, on what kind of taxation are those new territories going to have, and if all lands are going to have the same uh, kind of taxation, uh, if uh, former uh, the land of the former land of the king is going to have any specific taxation, as not it's really very complicated matter. 
the senators fully delegated the decision um, to the magistrate. But we have not preserved that parcel. We don't know if it's a council or a private. It's the convening magistrate. Um, so, we, and we see this in the text, um, which is highlighted. So, X being the consul or the praetor. The first reconstruction of the text uh, by Foucault uh, opted for um, a praetor, and Mumsen um, uh, was convinced um, by his uh, restoration, which would be strategos. Uh, but other historian has proposed that it to be uh, the consul because the reconstruction is not that clear. But anyway, it's the convenient magistrate. So prior consul is to determine what are the boundaries of the pergamines in its best, uh, best to him, the land within the boundaries exempted and safeguarded, so it may not be exploited uh, in general by uh, the publicans. The opinion of the Senate in this case is clear. The magistrate is entrusted with settling the matter without any restraints, any provisos. Okay? Um, again, this pattern of um, leaving the, the, the question into uh, the decision power of, of the council was also uh, used in the dispute between Oropos and the Publicani of 74, 73 regarding the tax immunity of the temple of Amphiarabs. Um, Sulla had granted uh, that privilege during his campaign of the East, uh, but then the Publicani argued that Amphiarabs was not really a god, he was just a hero, and if he's just a hero, he can be taxed uh, because he's not included in that um, exemption granted by, by Sulla. Um, so uh, the, uh, an, embass an embassy from Oropos went to um, uh, Rome, they argued the case. And the text that we've got is the letter of the consul, the consul, sorry, Marcus Terentius Barro Lucullus and Caius Cassius Longinus, in which they mention that in accordance with the decree of the Senate, we have reached a decision concerning the disputes between the God and Fiedas and the Publicans. So the text is really very, very clear. It's the consuls who have decided. Um, we have four of instances of um, partial delegations. And it's very interesting to note that there is a relatively common pattern. Um, and it's mainly that when the Senate delegates par a partial decision, it's usually to a praetor. There is one exception, which is the last one, the Senatus Consultum de Collegis Artificium. Uh, or, or Bacchiarum, which is a long, very long dispute between two guilds of uh, Dion, Dionysiac um, artists, which became a burning political issue um, in, in Athens. And in this case, the Senate delegates only a very uh, small matter, actually, about the common funds of these two guilds um, to the consul, and, it, and then the rest is um, decided. Uh, by the um, uh, Senate. For instance, in the Senatus Consultum, um, the, the Tisbensibus, uh, Tisbe had just uh, fallen under the control of a pro Roman um, uh, local elite, and the Senate has to debate on the fate of the city's anti Roman um, uh, faction. And the, uh, the Senate decide on almost on everything, including the possession of the Tisbean territory, buildings, harbor revenues, uh, the consolidation of the programming group, whether the city should be fortified uh, or not. Um, but the um, verdict of those Tisbeans who had opposed Rome and whether they should be incarcerated or not is left in the hands of the, in this case, praetor, who is the convening uh, magistrate. Um, um, so it's, it's really, um, this pattern, it's, it's, it's relatively um, um, clear. Um, there are several cases, or very, very, well, some cases, in which this delegation of decision into councils or practice has been preserved 
uh, that follows the previous procedure and pattern, including the, the formula, has been preserved in the literary sources. And we have, we find one of the clearest one in the account by Suetonius of the expulsion of philosophers and rhetors in 161, um, in which Suetonius says, uh, the Senate decreed that Marcus Pomponius, the praetor, should take it and provide in whatever way seen in accord with the interests of the state and his fears that they be not allowed to live in Rome. Um, so in this case, the praetor is expected to decide on the mode of expulsion, on the measures for expulsion, even possibly possible exemption, but the Senate decision left no room for doubt about the whole, um, about the whole issue. So it's really a partial uh, delegation that we find uh, here. It's also remarkable um, that most examples come from the second century BCE. So that is before Sulla's reform and the fact that the councils spent most of their time in Rome, not abroad. So this suggests that really this uh, decision power of the council was important in the second um, and century and was something carried out really in the very relative, sometimes short periods of time in which at least one of the consuls um, was um, in Rome. And um, another question that she could um, ask me straight away, and this is, you know, why did the Senate delegate? And we could also question ourselves, and why should the Senate not do it? The problem is that the texts that we've got are not very talkative about the specific circumstances in which the Senate uh, took the decision not to take a decision. And, and there are instances of very similar cases, typical disputes between Greek communities, and sometimes the Senate decides, and sometimes the Senate says, okay, let the council decide. So um, one of the very few um, hints that we got it's the uh, Senatus Consultum, the last one, the Senate, which is relatively fragmentary, the Senatus Consultum, the Agris Mytileneorum. Uh, Mytilene had supported Mithridates, so really the wrong side um, of the war, so it was compelled to pay tribute until 62, uh, when Pompey freed Mytilene, probably at the request of his friend Theophanes. In 55, um, or some uh, years uh, after uh, uh, this uh, measure by, by Pompey, the city of Mytilene had problems with the publicani who were really very keen on um, taxing them. So he went to Rome and look who is consul in 55, Pompey. Um, and he's, it's Pompey who has been delegated the decision uh, in this um, Senatus Consultum, so we say that it's not, and in this case, we may probably surmise that his influence, his strong personality, his relationship with Mithilin probably convinced the Senate that it was best to leave the matter into his hands. And see, Pompey was there in Rome, so it's really the same pattern that we are seeing um, here. But if I continue chronologically looking at this um, kind of procedure, I find I found that that formula, the Italia Repubblica, fideque um, suaviteratu, uh, is applied to magistrates who are in Rome, but there is no delegation of decision. So what's happening here? We have two instances: one in the literary sources and one in the epigraphic uh, sources, and they are consistent. The first one is in the Philippics. At the end of 44, uh, the conflict between Consul Antony and his opponent has escalated. And really it revolved, and at, that, at that moment, it revolved around the struggle for the control of Cisalpine gold. So uh, in, a, a senatorial, in, in a meeting of the Senate, Cicero proposed certain measures against Antony and ended his motion with uh, a proposal of a senator's consultum, which contained the very the, the familiar formula of delegation, but it had nothing to do with delegation uh, making. Let's look. That it pleases the Senate that Gaius Panza and Aulus Hirtius, consuls designate, so the consuls for 43, if they say fit, should as soon as possible after taking office make reference to this house concerning these matters and whatever manner, uh, sorry these matters in whatever manner may appear concerned with the public interest and their own fides. 
So in his confrontation with Consul Anthony, Cicero's proposal did not leave any room for delegating any decision to the next consuls. After the orator's, orator's strenuous efforts to control the situation, he and the senators who supported him wanted to really retain the initiative. The second case uh, involved a triumvir, um, and we thought um, um, uh, scholars thought previously that it was Antony, now it's believed to be Octavian, who sent a letter to the community of Clarassa Aphrodisias which contained a copy of the Senatus Consultant of 39 that granted them privilege. Um, so at the end, I'm sorry, at the end of the Senatus Consultant, um, uh, the consuls are requested to perform several tasks, such as award privileges to the ambassadors, to bring a law before the people, to have the, quest, the Senatus Consultant engraved, and all, as it's at the end, uh, in accordance with the interests of the state, of the Respublica, and with their own good faith. As in the previous case, the formula is employed, but the councils have no power of decision. The agency of the councils during the triumvirate was rather limited, since the triumvirates had usurped a very broad range of powers in Italy and in the Mediterranean, including consular imperium. The consuls still convened the Senate and probably also held contiones, issued edicts, and fulfilled their religious duties, but the presence, power, and control of the triumvirs loom over all their actions. In his work about the Senate of Imperial Rome, Talbert suggested that uh, he thought to have identified three instances in which a decision was, uh, in which a matter was delegated to the consuls, um, in three instances, so in, in 19, 22, and uh, 59. And one is from an epigraphic text and two uh, from um, um, Tacitus. However, in the three cases, the magistrates are not entrusted with the decision. They are entrusted with investigating the matter and then referring back to the Senate, who would be the, the institution, which would be the institution to take the decision. Um, the Senatus Consultum from uh, Larinum is quite clear, referentibus. Um, the case of 22 is the well known case about the right of asylum and all, the, all those Greek cities and temples presenting the, uh, the proofs for their antiquity. And, and we see that uh, the Senate uh, empowered the councils to investigate the titles and to refer the entire question back to the Senate. Oh, sorry. Uh, the last case is in 59, the well-known case of the violence that erupted in, in, in Pompeii. And the text says the trial of the affair was delegated by the emperor to the Senate and by the Senate to the councils. And then the case was being again led before the senators. So again, um, they invest, the consuls investigate the matter and they go back to the Senate. This is very different from the Republican Senatus Consulta, in which the text is clear the consuls are, in some cases, the praetors, not the Senate, are the ones taking the final decision. Um, so, in conclusion, um, the sources, especially epigraphic senatus consulta, consistently describe a pattern of senatorial decision making through which the Senate voted to delegate fully or partially the decision on a specific matter to a consul or a praetor who was in Rome. And that's the important part, in Rome. They account for almost half of the decisions recorded in epigraphic senatus consulta. Decision making on a variety of matters from foreign policy to tax disputes between the cities and publicani was delegated throughout the second and first century. And it had, it was marked by a very specific formula, which we have seen, which referred to the fevers of the magistrate, which is a very, um, which has a really strong cultural and ideological um, connotations. There are no grounds to speculate that the Senate delegate matters that were not of interest. Um, as we have seen, matters of arbitration, taxation, and dealings with foreign embassies are sometimes delegated, but not always. So this decision-making pattern, at least in the Republic, does not seem to have been a way in which the senators spared themselves long dealing with 
an important embassy. Okay, in the case of the very important Senatus Consultum, the Anglo Pergamenum, um, it's clear uh, in my opinion. This study, of, I have tried with this study also to illuminate the um, partially overlooked decision powers of, especially the consuls who are really taking whole decisions, uh, whole decisions in, in an, an issue. And finally, this pattern of decision making was part of routine government procedure as evidenced by the frequency in which, with which it appears in the prographic and sometimes uh, in the literary, uh, I've seen less frequent, in the literary sources. It fleshes out the uh, relationship between magistrates and the Senate, thus allowing us to go beyond the usual frames of confrontation and superiority between Senate and, and magistrates, and to gain, or at least attempt to gain some um, further um, or more insights into the question of who and how were uh, decisions taken in Roman uh, politics during the late. Republic. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much to you, Christina. Thank you very much. A very, very, a very interesting presentation. Well, I think there will be uh, plenty of questions. Well, plenty of things to debate. So I was, was I asked uh, to people if they, oh, wait, we have already a question. Perfect. <laughs> Amy Russell. Hi, Christina. Thank Hi, you so Amy. much. That was really, really great. I've got, uh, I've taken tons of notes. I, I found that absolutely fascinating. Um, but the thing it made me think about was, um, and I assume I, I, I'm really looking forward to hearing what you what you think about this, um, is is what happens if we flip this around and look at it from the kind of from the consul's perspective, or or maybe actually really I'm talking about the perspective of the the Greek cities here. Um, or the other individuals who would be involved in this decision making, because it seems to me that some of the stuff that you're talking about is stuff that you might expect the consul or the proconsul on the on the on the uh, uh, who's who's there in person to be making these decisions in the normal course of things. So my question is, this stuff that can be delegated to the officials on the ground, what's the procedure by which it comes to the Senate in the first place? Like, how's how's that original decision being made? That this is something that the Senate needs to decide rather than just kind of assuming or oh, the consul on the ground is going to do it. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, well, actually, usually the pattern is those when Greek cities have a problem, probably they also resort at first to the proconsul or governor who is in place. That in a very a uh, large number of cases, we see that they travel to Rome because it's really the Senate who usually, which usually decide on this matter regarding publicani, taxation, etc. And if you think about it logically, uh, it's the Senate and the censors who are um, um, granting the contracts or the subcontracts for taxation to the publicani. So to what extent a proconsul can have are saying this, um, I'm not. I'm not sure that probably because of ignorance. Maybe there are some cases which really escape it. Now that you are, that you, and I was thinking through um, your question. Um, when we see in the inscription and especially in the literary sources, all these embassies spending such a long time uh, in Rome trying to be heard, etc. And if the Senate decided, you know, it's the council or the praetor who is going to decide on this. Suddenly you don't have to court thousands, hundreds of senators. You just have to court the right person and that right person is the council uh, or the praetor. And, you know, then you can concentrate your efforts on that. Well, um, another point which I haven't uh, mentioned, but otherwise the paper would be uh, very long, is that usually when we have all these instances in which really the council have to decide, and in general, in all the decisions that magistrates are in room, okay, I'm, I'm saying in room, may, they usually, well, they usually, they always have, it's expected that they have a concilium. And a concilium is advising. The final decision is always the consul or the praetor. And I, I would say consul just for, to, to make it short, okay? Um, because he doesn't have to decide what the consilium suggests. 
But the concilium in Rome is, um, and I have um, work um, about this recently, a concilium in Rome is the indication, is the mark that you are following correct senatorial and legislative procedure, that you have listened to other people, that it's open, the membership of that concilium, which is usually convened ad hoc for every specific cases, the persons who were there and were known, in the sense that they are usually uh, listed on the senatus consultant. Um, so it's not a small coterie of non-people deciding on something, but it's, uh, in a public, it's public display of the magistrate with the consilium surrounding him deciding on something. So it's also performative uh, in that uh, in that sense. Um, yeah, but, but thank you. I think yeah, I could push it farther from the point of view of the council. That was very helpful. Okay, we have a, a pretty, pretty lot, lot, lot of questions. Well, if I'm not mistaken, it's the turn of um, Manfred Zanin. Uh, already answered, no problem. Ah, okay. <laughs> and Francis' question was uh, the same as mine, so okay. no problem. Well, 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 well. We sh shall I add uh, just a, a, very, a very small, very little remark? I think we have some cases in literary sources in which is the council who, who likes to, uh, to ask to the Senate to confirm his decision. So he, he can uh, ask to the Senate um, per literas uh, uh, to have a response that, uh, which fits already fits with the decision that the consuls uh, uh, has already imagined, well, figured, no? Don't you think so? We have some, I think we have in Libya some cases uh, in which uh, magistrates the ask- consuls uh, who are in Rome, usually it's consuls- or Well, no, I was wondering about consuls in, uh, in Italy, in, uh, in, in the battlefields, for example. Yeah absolutely. yeah, absolutely. That is very regular and it's part of, of the rules of how the magistrate and the Senate um, relate to one each other. So mm -hmm. sometimes um, they have, uh, um, the consul is, is going, he proposed something, you know, this is my decision, what do you think? And then the Senate mm. writes it or not. It's very uh, indicative. Uh, one of the cases of delegation of, um, of magistrates um, on the field that I have uh, mentioned, mm -hmm. I find it very uh, illustrative. Let me just look at it, yeah. Um, in 213, 212, the proconsul Marcus Claudius Marcellus is approached by a number of soldiers. Those soldiers are survivors of the Battle of Cannae. They were expelled or taken away from, not expelled, taken away from the legions and they were um, left in Sicily. They are somehow incarcerated in, in Sicily. Mm -hmm. and, and those veterans approach the proconsul and they say, you know, we would like to fight against Hannibal. Please accept us back into the legions. So the proconsul writes to the, um, to the Senate and the answer of the Senate is the following. We don't like that. We don't want that, okay? Um, but if you decide that this is the best case, okay, then do it, but we don't like it. Okay, but sometimes they are leaving the, again the decision in um, in the consuls, and this is as I said at the beginning. This is sensible. This is obvious because they are the persons who are in situ. They are in play in, in the place, and they they know better on what are the implications and the consequences of all these decisions. But I was interested in uh, uh, those magistrates in Rome. They are in Rome with the rest of the senators, and somehow they are being the. the they are left with the decisions for um, themselves, which was um, what struck me uh, when I first began with, with this research. Thank you. Well, I leave the floor to others because there are, uh, we have a lot of questions. Michele, Michele Bellomo. Yeah, thank you. Even if you have quite already answered to, to my question in this last case, because when you started uh, with later centuries, examples I was um, it came to my mind Arthur Eckstein's work on Senate and general on individual decision making and Roman foreign relations which was published I think in 1987 where it draws a firm line of distinction between uh, the Senate and consuls uh, relations in Italy where the Senate wanted or was able to impose a strict control on the magistrates and outside the peninsula where the commanders on the field were able to manipulate the information with the Senate in order to pursue their own policy. And so as Eckstein's conclusions are mainly based on uh, literary evidence, uh, do you think that 
there we are missing something for the lack of epigraphic text of Senatus Consulta, and uh, should we rethink about uh, the relationship between Senate and generals or magistrates during the mid Republic, considering what you have outlined today uh, on the text of the Senatus Consulta, or were just things working differently in the third century as to the late second and first century BC? So, thanks. Ciao, Michele. That's a very good question. Um, I haven't thought about that. My feeling is, well, frankly, we are tied up by the evidence. Um, and um, this, is a, this could be presented as a boring legislative procedure, you know, very fine, small difference, because at the end, you know who takes the decision or not. Um, um, that's why it's so absent from literary sources, I think. And it, it, it may be, and because when we think, um, as, as you have rightly mentioned and Eckstein uh, proposed, when you are in the field, obviously you can somehow uh, control the information that you are going to send the Senate. Obviously, other senators have other sources of information than the general who is commanding the army in the field and there are other um, all those junior officers and all the coterie around which we know regularly are, are sending letters to Rome in the case of Marius, for instance. It's, it's very clear how it's really a very um, constant flow of information in that sense. But anyway, you can somehow um, uh, control that. Uh, but in this case, what we are seeing is that all of them, the Senate, the senators, um, and, and the consuls who are dealing with these matters, all of them are in Rome. They, maybe they don't have all the sources of information, but the circulation of information in Rome is relatively fluid. And um, so I think, um, yeah, this is an, another um, level of relationship probably. And I like to see it more as an interaction because I, I mentioned before, most of the studies have focused on the confrontation. And it obviously, if you are reading Livy, you will find lots of magistrates who go against the Senate or who are defiant because that makes good history. And, and it's, you know, those, you know, um, I don't know, those great generals um, trying to manipulate the Senate or the Senate trying to control them. Um, but this is root team stuff. Um, and maybe it has not the implications for Mediterranean domination uh, that have other um, patterns, but it's, it's another way of relationship, I think, when both the Senate and the, the, sorry, the Council and the Senators are in the same place. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll think far about it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, Mark German, please. Ah, well, thank you very much. Um, um, first of all, thank you very much for the very uh, interesting talk and for raising the issue of uh, delegations um, of um, decisions away from the Senate, actually. So my question would be, um, what would you make of, um, of cases of delegations of decisions to other groups of actors? Um, Specifically, um, what comes to mind is, uh, for me, is the, um, is the case of, um, uh, of the year, I think it's 184, where, according to Polybius, um, the Senate uh, delegated a decision concerning the conflict with the Achaean League, with Sparta, the ongoing conflict over there, to a commission of three ex-ambassadors headed by um, Flamininus, for example. And none of them are magistrates at the time. So that would be my question. What would you make of these instances or, um, yeah, if, of the whole thing actually of delegation away to ex ambassadors, for example, as opposed to magistrates? Thank you. Yeah, thanks. That's a fascinating topic, really, um, which um, I'd like to, to study more in depth um, one day when, when we will have all time. And um, commissions. Subcommissions. Um, when the Senate decide, okay, let's, which is typically, you know, it sounds very modern, let's form a subcommission and think about this. There are actually not those many instances. There is yeah. that one uh, that you are mentioning about Flamininus, and there are two or three more. And um, Momsen, who had read everything, just identified those three, and we have been not been able to, to find uh, uh, more, um, which is something, you know, for us, it would be very. Natural to, you know, let's 
to a small group of people who um, do that. So um, I, I, I really cannot give you a um, full, complete, coherent answer about that because I think I like to look at them more now that I have done this research. Because as Amy was saying, you know, you shift the, the point of view, you shift the perspective. At least I want to shift that perspective when I study this to um, see how can we approach this and this um, routine uh, matters. And for instance, the, the question that you have uh, mentioned um, it's, it, it's important, it's a relevant question. It's not something secondary, you know, oh my God, boring Greek people talking here in Greek uh, about all the stuff. Oof. No, it's, it's the relationship with the Achaean League 184. And so it's really, you know, foreign affairs at the top high level. Um, so yeah, but I think that's, that's very, Illustrative. Another, for instance, point that I think should I, I would like to review in, in, in that sense are the decem legati, um, which go there, they go on the field, and somehow they have to work with the magistrates who's there, and they are somehow the representatives of what the Senate want. And both the commander and the decem legati should somehow collaborate, but both of them really have power of decision. So it's really, I, I think it would be useful to look at them from this point of view, at least uh, for what I want to do from this point of view, um, not, you know, the moments of confrontation, etc., not as um, uh, included in the analysis of other uh, legati, but really as a specific form, uh, but yeah, that, Sorry, I cannot really answer in full. Thank you. Well, we have a question still in the chat room and then three uh, yellow ends. Uh, well, so, Roman Roth. Yeah, thank you very much for a really fascinating um, paper. And my question actually follows on from the last two, really. Um, so it has partly been answered. And my question was, um, do you think it mattered who the people were um, I who the magistrates were to whom the the Senate um, delegated authority. In other words, do you think? I mean, this this wise follows on from the last question as well. What sort of contribution can you make to the whole the old debate over specialism versus non-specialism? Whether, whether the Senate actually was, was very um, aware of specialists and and deliberately used them? Yes, um, I think individual people did matter. And we see that clearly in the case of Pompey. And um, who, uh, is the Senate going to decide on Italy? No, okay, let's leave that to Pompey, who you know, had really strong links with Italy, has a very close friend who is from there, you know, who else? Um, and I think the relationship between the, uh, uh, I mean, it's not something new, and Monson already said that, uh, the relationship in, between magistrate and the Senate cannot be summarized into general rules of patterns because it really depends on the individual uh, um, individual character and individual initiatives and strategies of the senators and of the magistrates. So magistrates have more charisma, were more powerful, have more influence, or there's less. Um, some the, also the dynamics between the Senate. The problem is that we cannot really reach that for the senators consulta like we've got. It's very difficult. Um, but um, yeah, I, I like that you, you. I like very much your point about the specialist versus non-specialist. Uh, we don't know, for instance, whether um, Calpurnius Piso knew something about Crete, actually, um, or not. But actually, um, they could um, they could solve that problem with having somebody in the concilium who knew about that, and you could really have persons there. You know, I was there uh, as a commander, or I was there um, as a legatus, or whatever. So I could really, you know, or have strong links with Cretan cities, or I know uh, about fine points of um, Roman law because all the intricacies, legal details, and intricacies of the Senatus Consultum de Agro Pergameno. This is really complicated to to I to settle. Um, yeah, but, but for that they have the consulium. 
um, you know, they expound that, they put forward their opinions, and then it's the consul who takes the final decision, um, taking into account whatever he wants to take into account. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, well, if I'm, I'm not mistaken, it's uh, Antonio Dupla. I think. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Cristina, for your very interesting uh, uh, talk, as, uh, as always are. Um, and uh, I, I will ask you about another kind of uh, delegation of decision, uh, which are, or uh, I, 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 I'm thinking about the uh, Senatus Consulta Ultima, or the, the, the so-called uh, Senatus Consultum Ultimum, uh, because I think uh, it is true that uh, we are dealing there with very different uh, situations, very critical um, political confrontations, but in fact, they are all um, a kind of, of delegation of decision. No? And uh, we don't have, a, 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 strictly speaking, a, a formula, but uh, sometimes we read, Vidian uh, consules nequid res publica detrimenti capiat, etc., etc., and uh, and then the, the consuls and sometimes also other magistrates have to do uh, something to control the situation. Don't you think that this uh, are also some kind of uh, delegations of decisions? Thank you. Uh, hola, Antonio. Uh, oh. um, I have thought about that. Uh, but you're the specialist about the Senatus Consultum Ultimum, not me. What do you think? I think that, the, the, in fact, uh, these are delegations of, of decisions. Okay, I have to look at this closer, but yeah, it's, it's very suggestive. I haven't thought about that. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a great point. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Well, Christoph, please. Thank you, Christy. Christina, very much. That was very interesting. I enjoyed that. Um, although I admit, when you said in the middle of your talk, is it maybe just the Senate is bored with all the Greek stuff? I thought, yes, this is exactly what I think. They're just bored with all the Greek stuff. And your example from Crete, I mean, surely they had no idea where this was, this island, or where, they had no interest in this matter whatsoever. I'm quite sure, but of course I can't prove it. Now, all my other questions have been asked. Um, Amy um, asked the interesting question in the beginning. So I'm, I have to adjust my thinking and I want to ask, why is nothing in Polybius? Now, one answer would be because Polybius did not think this was a decision. And so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to have two questions. One is why is nothing in Polybius? And the second is, is it really a decision? Um, because it's, it's always a kind of corridor of saying, okay, these are the options, whatever you do is fine. And also we have in the end this clause, which always gives the Senate this idea of, in the end, if we're not happy with it, we can always say it wasn't really in the interest of the Respublica. So exactly um, what Antonio Dupla just asked, I would, I would disagree with it and say it's the other way around. If we compare it with the SCU, it's not, an, it's not the delegation of, the, of a decision, it's the delegation of, implementa of implementing something. And if everything works out, it's fine. And if it doesn't work out, the Senate can always say well, it wasn't done in a proper way. So I'm questioning um, yeah, both Polybius and the question whether it's really a delegation of decision and not kind of a delegation of implementation. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'll, I'll go back to Crete in, in, a, in a second. Okay. Um, why is nothing then in Libya? Okay. Yeah. Because it's something, you know, very formal-like. It's something of routine procedure, uh, which it's not 
which is not really be too appealing. Well, obviously I'm not oblivious. I'm not deciding who gets some into my histories or not, but I think that when we look at, and I really look very carefully at the text, um, at the Senatus Consulta in Greek, um, trying to see, okay, there are other possible translations. But when the Greek words are so straightforward, we have decided, I cannot really find any ambiguity with that. Um, what happened, you have pointed out, okay, they say, yeah, as long uh, Respublica and the Fides, I haven't talked about that, but, you know, the Fides of the magistrate is really a very cultural and ideologically charged. And it's not only the Senate who uses this kind of languages, they are the Senate themselves. When Cicero tries to, um, when Cicero asks a fellow proconsul to decide on a matter um, regarding a friend of Cicero, he is, you know, try to do as much as you can, of course, until your fides allow you. And he puts that twice in letters of recommendation. So it's not, sim it's not something that the Senate used to control the magistrate because we have not one single instances in instance, sorry, in which the Senate decide, says, you know, I don't like what you said. I'm going to take the decision myself. We don't have one. Mm -hmm. um, so we have that in the imperial cases that I have shown. Right. You know, the closest investigate, they then go back to the Senate and the senators are the ones who are taking the final decision. When a, when a consul or a pair of consuls, as I have said in several of these letters, write to a Greek community and said, okay, and usually the structure is always the same. Here's my letter, I have decided, and here you have the Senatus Consultum, the text of the Senatus Consultum, the, you know, and trusted me with decided on these matters. And this is the decision, that's it. And the Greek community has that written down. Um, so there was not going back uh, in that sense. So I, I really, and I thought really long about this, whether we could find some ambiguities and I can't really find them. It's, and, and, and it's a delegation of decision. It's the consul who are, the consuls who, consul or consuls, who are going to take the decision mm -hmm. Uh, at the at the end, are they going to follow what was mostly agreed, for instance, or not? Because we don't know what happened during the opinions in the Senate regarding these matters. Whether there was, you know, one strong opinion, and then the Senate say, okay, you decide, but you know that what we agree, or whether there was a split opinion and they were more or less equal. We don't know. We don't have that information. We love to have that information, um, as many things, um, but we can't. Um, regarding Crete, at the beginning, you know, I really agree with you. I was like, oh my God, this is the second or third time that these people are coming to wrong. But then when you look at it from a, a, a wider political context, Crete was in the middle of a civil war in the 140s. The Roman Senate had to send a magistrate to try to put some calm with soldiers into that civil war. And we see, and obviously Crete is a very important geopolitical place in the Mediterranean. So really the Roman Senate wants to have a very strong hold. It's interested, obviously you have a very strong hold in Crete. So, I thought that maybe we could also flip it around um, and, and not think this as a you know, very small, boring procedure, you know, very small island, but we are talking, okay, this, that island um, of Loike, it's very small, but it's a small island in, the, in that part of the Mediterranean and all these islands are really important. And I think um, um, it, it's somehow, um, I think our, our vision of, you know, Greek people saying boring things is uh, influenced by that comment actually that I, I, I mentioned on the senatorial debate of 22, uh, CE of Tacitus in which you say, oh my God, all these Greek people boasting about their antiquities. Okay, let the council hear about this and this is too boring. And, and, and Tacitus says uh, explicitly uh, weary of the details, um, uh, and disliking the acrimony of the discussion is like you might, 
this is horrible. Um, the case of the of the Dionysiac guilds, first time they go to Rome uh, with that, and it's like, pfft. but then you think of it, it was really a matter of civic importance for Athens. And we are in 112, and Athens it's relevant for Greek interest uh, of, of the, the Roman interest, sorry, in, in Greece. So, you know, um, obviously I can't be 100% sure about this, but I don't think that we should always regard this as PD procedures and boring stuff. And then you have the Senatus, uh, the Senatus Consultum di Agro Pergameno, which is top, top thing. Um, so yeah, maybe or maybe not. Thank you. Okay, I forgot then to um, put it, to pay to pay attention to Henriette written comment. Uh, it's my fault. Sorry. Uh, would you like to expand it or? I don't know if, if she hear me. Henriette van der Blum. Van der Blum. I do hear you. I have trouble with the, yeah. the unmute thingy, but now I found out if I hit the, the space key I, and hold it down, it will work. So I'll just hold it down. Sorry, um, I apologize. Sorry about my technical incompetence. Mm -hmm. um, my point was really to come back to when we were talking about um, the individuals. And I thought if we're thinking of who the individuals are, consuls or in the concilium, surely it also matters who are really the, the senators leading the discussion. And so they, like Christina, you said, um, Cicero's proposal for in the third Philippic, he had a certain angle to it. So that was just my point there. I have another question, but I'll wait until my time in the queue. I should prefer, I should yes, yes, Henriette, of course, you're right. Yeah, yeah, obviously. We, the thing is, we don't know much about that. What happened with that discussion regarding those two cities in Crete? And yeah, I think, yeah, it, it, it's always the individuals uh, and the individuals and all, all those dynamics shift um, and change through time because they are different uh, persons, obviously, and they have different um, uh, interests, influences, relations, whatever. But yes, um, definitely, yeah. Uh, well, okay, Amy, please. Um, oh, thank you. Well, it was it was a very minor point um, following on from what Mark said. Um, although, let me say, I already said this was a fantastic paper. This has also been a fantastic discussion session. This is one one for the ages. You know, when I see uh, uh, when I see Antonio climb uh, bring up the SCU and then Christoph is next on the list. It's you know, this is going. Um, um, uh, no, I was just uh, what what Mark mentioned about um, appointing people to be sort of committees or even to be um, mediators. It made me think about um, how your um, and this has come up also in your answer to a later question about the the actual formula being so important, which I take which I take uh, that's a really good point. Um, but I was wondering that you've got this kind of um, conceptual division between things that are decisions and things that are not decisions. But does that map on to how the Senate actually behaves? I think it can still be a really vital conceptual decision. But in terms of senatorial procedure, how, how much does this differ from appointing someone to be a mediator or appointing someone to do some really boring task like dedicate a temple, you know? Um, they, they're appointing people to do things all the time. And does the actual procedure differ if they're appointing someone to make a decision versus if they're appointing some, someone to do something, which will involve various decisions. If you appoint someone to give gifts to an ambassador, they're going to have to make decisions about what those gifts are going to be. And, you know, um, where, you know, does, so procedurally, is it the same or is it different? Yeah, that's, that's really um, a good point. Um, um, yeah. I like your point about the procedure. Um, at the end, is the result the same? But probably yes. I mean, for a Greek community, regardless who had taken the decision, the decision is there. Probably the uh, development of the procedure is different. As I mentioned when we were um, um, talking, uh, you and I were talking uh, before, um, 
you know, for a Greek embassy on the ground in Rome, it's different when you have suddenly to approach um, consul and his concilium or, you know, other key senators who would be um, willing to help you. But what happens if they are not in that concilium? Um, then you have to find new, um, some other persons. And, um, And sometimes the we just have that for um, no we have twice that the delay the, the amount of time between the senators consult and the decision of the council is very short sometimes just a couple of days um, it's in Oropos and it's in another one which I can't remember right now um, so that also you know gives you um, a, a hint and. The result may be the same, um, but I think, yeah, that, that's a good point. And that's really how I wanted to approach this matter of the relationship between Senate and magistrate, you know, working somehow um, um, together or not, but within, you know, between things, um, which are maybe less. Um, yeah, no, I mean, it's absolutely a yes. testimony to the power of your approach that well. this discussion is bringing up all these really interesting edge cases, I think. Um, yeah, thanks. Thank you to both. Well, Federico, it's your turn. Thank you. And thank you, Christina. Um, that formula that brings feeders into the, into the equation, what's the earliest attestation that you've been able to locate? Uh, it's in all the Senatus Consulta that I have mentioned. Um, so at least in the Senatus Consulta, the first one is 170, that is Vencibus. Okay. And uh, um, how is it rendered in Greek? Into uh, Greek, rather. I'm going to share the screen so you can. Uh, Thank you. Okay. It's here. Okay, so it's pistis. Okay. It's, it's always it's always the same. It's it's, it's it has been described, especially by um, epigraphists. Um, it has been described as form lake, or uh, not having somehow a meaning. You know, being a very subtle formula. But I think that this formula is very indicative of the relationship between the magistrate and the senate. The insistence of the feeders of the magistrate on the interest of the respublica. Yes. I think it's culturally and ideologically very charged. And, and I have um, 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 I haven't presented this here, but I have tried to you know to look at these contents of the feeders of the magistrate, and we have very interesting or um, telling instances. Um, uh, from, for instance, a uh, uh, proconsul who, uh, proconsul, sorry, um, who um, rise to a city at the beginning of the first century BC, and he said, you know, I'll, I'll try to do whatever I can as long as, uh, as long as my fides allows it. So it's really, I think, it's an important concept for a Roman magistrate. Um, we can be very cynical about it. We can no, no. May understand it as something that, you know, the Senate is trying to control it. But I think it, it's there and it's part of the ideological construct of the persona of the Roman magistrate, that yeah. fides. And Cicero, I think Cicero mentions uh, at least once, you know, uh, it's, it's the Respublica is entrusted into the fides yeah. of the magistrate. It's really how they conceive it ideologically. But it's also eminently translatable, so I suppose it would have also resonated with Greek audiences as a fact that it didn't simply bind the, 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 the magister to a certain pattern of behaviour towards the Senate, but also towards non-Romans, so th thank you very much, yes. Thanks. Well, okay. I've seen, I see the chat room anymore. <laughs> well, I think it's a Roman... Uh... Uh, no, Henriette, sorry, I'm sorry, again, Henriette, it's your turn. Sorry again. No problem. Um, so my question, Christina, is an attempt to help you give, perhaps add some more uh, further weight to your argument, but I don't know whether it works, but um, because I don't know 
exactly which instances there would be, but I'm thinking of what happens afterwards. I.e., if something goes wrong with whatever decision is taken, who is being blamed? Is it the magistrate? And therefore, then we can say for sure it is the magistrate's decision. Or is it the Senate? I, you know, it's just delegation, but the Senate is ultimately responsible. I then, so coming back really to, to Christoph's uh, question. And I think if there are any instances telling you about some controversy and who is then being blamed or who is at least being seen as responsible, that would be further, I, I imagine, support for your argument. Are there any such instances? Epigraphically not. And no. the problem with the literary sources is that they don't really address this question of the delegation of the decision um, making um, um, a power. Um, I love to have that. The only instances in which, I, I mean, it's, it's a very long shot, obviously, but when we see that in the 40s and the 30s, the senators are not given one inch away to the councils. That makes me think that this is real agency. Um, and I don't know if really the Senate, I, I, I don't know, so if anyone has any answer, I, I'd love to hear about it. I don't know if the Senate really blames itself in any moment for any wrong decision. You know, it took the decision, oh my God, with what <laughs> this was horribly wrong decision. Um, um, so I don't know if anyone has uh, an example in mind. Um, and uh, really, frankly, it's, it's out of ignorance uh, right now. Uh, but I don't know really the Senate function with on those parameters. I mean, the Senate really second guess themselves and then they think, you know, poof, this really blew it up. And, Probably not in public. <laughs> yeah, but that would be interesting to see, you know, if that was discussed in a senatorial meeting. Um, that would be fascinating. But, Really, if anyone finds an example, please do tell me. Uh, I'd love to have that. Thanks. Thanks. Roman Frolov. Thank you so much. Uh, exciting paper and exciting discussion. Just, just, just a very small question, thinking about what decision is. So my impression is that you're thinking about the final decision when somebody finally has to take, to make the move. But when, for instance, uh, we're speaking about these small decisions or, or, or not small decisions, but some decisions about small communities. I think that maybe in this case, it's something like if you, if you put this uh, on the agenda, uh, no matter what kind of decision is taken, the very fact that you put it on the agenda, this may be small question, uh, maybe not, I don't know. Uh, so the discussion is split perhaps. But the very fact that you put it on the agenda and if, you, if the Senate ask uh, a magistrate, even if they ask to implement the decision which the magistrate has in mind, the very fact that the decision is now on the agenda may be important and uh, may be considered even uh, as a real decision, something perhaps even more important than making the choice in the end between some other options. I don't know, maybe if, if this is uh, at all relevant, just, 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 just a thought about it, what, what do you think? Yeah, uh, yeah, thanks, um, Roman. Um, yeah, obviously, obviously it's, it's, the, it's one of the tasks, and Polybius said so this time, is one of the tasks of the councils to introduce all these embassies um, to the Senate. Um, we don't know if there were cases, or I don't know if there were cases in which the council decided, okay, we are not even dealing with this. Um, um, because it's, it's part of governance. You know, it's like when we have in the um, long shot again, in imperial times, the emperor writing down to all this singular petition of a very small group of farmers in the middle of the, in North Africa about this. It's part of governance, it's part of what makes, and especially in the Republic, in the second century, for instance, it's part of what's making Rome a Mediterranean superpower, okay? Before all these cases of arbitration, um, before there were small um, cities arbitrating uh, other cities, but when we arrive to Hellenistic time, it's the kings also who are arbitrating all these matters. So 
if Rome wants to really be the power in the Mediterranean, okay, this is part of the responsibilities that you have to take and you have to solve all these problems. And then it's, it's very interesting going back to uh, what Henrietta, no, Amy, sorry said there are different procedures of dealing with this. Sometimes the Senate, the Senate decides on the question directly. Sometimes, as we have, as I have presented, they delegate the decision. Other times, they appoint a third um, party as, as arbitrator. So we see there are different procedures. And we don't really know what sometimes they took. They, they opted for one procedure and not the other. Um, Probably it's not it, well, probably it's not random. Obviously, there is a logic that we cannot see because there are not enough sources or not enough sources to allow uh, allow us to see a pattern of of decision. But I think yeah, it, it, it's part of the job um, if you want to control and and, and rule and and govern and be there, be the power, one of the powers, um, especially in the second century when they are still there and it's not clear. And um, I think it, it's part of it. Thanks. Thank you. Well, a huge debate. <laughs> if you are not, well, if you are not tired, we, are, we still have some time, some more time if you, somebody else would like to speak or ask questions. Okay, that's okay. Is enough? Okay. So thank you to everybody. Uh, really, really, very, very thank you to Christina and uh, to all the participants for this really, uh, very interesting question, very, very, very interesting discussion. So very, 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 very... Thank you very much for everybody with all these um, comments yeah. and suggestions. It's, it's really helpful hearing all these um, enlightened voices. Thank you. Um, and the discussion was, was so very challenging. Thanks, it was great. I will, would like just to remind uh, next week uh, seminar, we will have Raphael Legnou um, about accepter ou refuser les pouvoirs personnels, l'expression politique durant la guerre civile des années 40 et 30. So um, I can see you next week, next Thursday. I think you can stop the recording, Federico. Mm -hmm. I will.